You are now listening to the Sylvester McNutt the Third podcast. Free your energy. In today's episode, we're going to talk about letting go. I promise you that if you listen or watch the entire way through, letting go is something that you will know how to do. You will know how to execute, execute this idea of letting go. I'm going to be reading a little bit from my book on healing care package. I'm going to be sharing some stories with you. But first, let's start off with a quote. Let's start off with a quote from the Care Package book. If you want to change your life, focus on being brave. To be brave means that you're scared, that you're the underdog, but you're still going to give it everything you have. You got to give it everything you have. So whatever you're dealing with right now in life, you have to let go, right? That's why you're listening. Or watching if you're here on YouTube. If you guys don't know on the podcast, I post these on YouTube, youtube.com slash Sly McNutt, S-L-Y-M-C-N-U-T-T. For those of you out there in YouTube, you guys, I'm smiling at you. Hopefully you hearers can hear me smiling, all right? Listen, sound good, all right? For all you guys on YouTube, make sure you follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. You can just type my name in, Sylvester McNutt III, I'll come up. Let's connect. Let's connect. Brave. To be brave is what you have to remember, right? In this podcast, in this video, I'm going to teach you how to move on. It's a process. So I'm going to teach you a process that works for me. It's a very simple process. This is, this is, you could take notes and call it Sly McNutt's process for moving on. Step one for moving on is you have to understand that you're going to have to be brave. Bravery. I mean, when we when we talk about bravery, we usually talk about, you know, firefighters or or a husband or wife who who risked his or her life to save, you know, the family. We, We talk about soldiers. Usually when we're talking about bravery, we're talking about someone who is at risk for a great loss. And they're sacrificing for a greater cause. Right? And when we talk about bravery in the context of moving on, you have to understand that if you're trying to move on from something in your life, you're attempting to be brave. You're attempting to sacrifice. You're attempting to let go. You're attempting to fight for a greater cause. That's what bravery is. So, right now, you need to pat yourself on the back. Because you're trying. And that's all you have. When it comes to moving on, you have to remember that all you have is effort. That's all you have. There is an element of practice and repetition and effort when it comes to moving on. So you need to be proud of yourself that you're trying because you're being brave. So remember, the first element to moving on is understanding that you will have to be brave. The second element to moving on is to understand that you're going to have to put in effort. That's directly connected to bravery. Now, right here, I'm about to tell you the four things you have to always focus on if you're moving on. Right. So moving on means change. Let's accept that. Moving on means change. These are the four things you need to focus on if you're trying to change. Behavior, idea, connection, pain. If you have to move on from something, from a situation, from a person, from whatever it is, everything you deal with in terms of moving on comes down to behavior, idea, connection, or pain. If you have any problems in your life and you say, okay, I need to move on from this. I need to change this. This needs behavior, idea, connection, or pain. 
Let's break it down. No, I know it sounds simple, but let's break it down. Behavior. I might have to let go. Here, let me start over. I'm suffering, okay? I am suffering right now. I am in a state of pain, okay? This is a hypothetical situation here. Come into my world. Come into my story. I'm in a state of pain, okay? So now, introspectively, I have to ask myself, is it a behavior that I have that is causing me this pain? Is it a behavior that is stopping me from getting to where I want to go? Is it a behavior that I have to let go of? I have conflict. I have this conflict I'm dealing with. So let me ask, is it a behavior? You know what? I don't think it is a behavior. What is it then? Maybe it's an idea. Maybe, maybe the reason why you're suffering the reason why I'm suffering is because I have an idea. And this idea, because this idea is not the present moment, this idea is not reality fully. This idea causes me suffering. So what if in order for me to be happy in life, I just need to let go of the idea or the idea ideals that I'm holding on to? What if the path to my happiness is literally just changing the ideas that I believe in? Connection. What if I am connected to a school that causes me a great deal of pain? I'm a junior in college. I don't want to be at this college. I don't want to be in this major. I don't know why I'm in college. I'm just here fulfilling a destiny that my parents picked for me. What if the connection to this college is the source of my pain? What if it's my connection to another person, a friend, a family member, a loved one? What if they are the source my pain is it is that possible is it possible that my connection to the some of the roots of my culture are causing me pain is it possible that my religion is causing me pain and is that something that i may have to let go of number four pain what if it is the pain of a situation, the pain of a memory, the pain of a story. What if it's pain that I have to let go of? Because I know that the pain is stopping me. Those are the four elements that you have to consider around letting go, behavior, idea, connection, pain. When it's time to let go of something in life, ask yourself, is it one of these four things? Is it a behavior? Is it an idea? Is it connection? Or is it pain itself? And when you start there, when you introspectively start there, then it's very easy to see what you need to focus on. The reason why people have a hard time letting go is because they don't know exactly what they need to focus on. We spend so much time saying what we don't want. And by doing so, we give more energy to what we don't want. When we complain, we create a, a pathway for complaining, for the energy that comes with what we don't want. If there's something that you want to let go of, all you need is a daily affirmation. Every morning, every night, say it to yourself aloud or quietly. I am ready to let go of this. I am ready to let go of that. Or change the words and make it even more powerful and say, 
In my heart, I have already let go of that. In my mind, I have already let go of that. If you believe in soul, in my soul, I have already let go of that. Every day, say that to yourself. I have already let go of that. I have already let go. I am at peace with letting go of that. That's how you heal. That's how you let go. That's how you let go. Is it a behavior? Is it an idea? Is it a connection? Is it a pain? Wow. You start there and, and now letting go becomes easy. talk to you about letting go I want to talk to you about a story that uh, something I experienced and initially I was, I was going to read from the book but I would rather just tell you about it now that we're here in this moment sharing this good space together you know, I really appreciate you guys for tuning in. Appreciate you guys on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify, Instagram. Appreciate you guys. Let's talk about, let me close my notes. Let me make sure you, you know this is coming from, from the heart here. I was kicked out of the house uh, as a teenager. I graduated high school, I was 17 years old from Palatine High School, Illinois. Went to Northern Illinois University my freshman year. And um, came back home to my dad's apartment. Now, we didn't have a good relationship at this point. Um, at this point in time, he, he was an alcoholic. He was disabled. So, uh, you know, He's like me in a lot of ways because, or maybe I should say I'm like him in a lot of ways, because uh, a lot of men will get a sense of identity uh, based off of the work that they do. I can for sure tell you uh, that I, I'm one of those people. I, lo I love my work. I love what I do. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons I've left, left jobs before is because they didn't align with me, you know, or my core values or my ideas or, you know, just like where I wanted to be in life. So... I definitely can say that I align and identify with the work that I do, which is why I wanted to make sure I do a career that fulfills me. You know, so my dad was very similar. He, he, he did a lot of culinary chef and then later in his career got into uh, management you know, um, creating different dietary plans, hiring, firing, uh, promoting, training, very leadership oriented human being. So my dad was an alcoholic. Um, he was abusive. He was stressed out. He was stressed out all the time. He didn't deal with stress well. And, uh, I come back home that, that first summer after um, school, after, after my first freshman year. I get a job working at Home Depot in the garden department. Now, that was a great job, by the way. And um, one day I'm at the house. And I mean, I'm in and out. You know, I go work out, getting ready for football. So I'll, I'll wake up, go hit a workout, go hit a jog, go to work, and that's it. I, you know, I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, I didn't do anything. I was just, I was a goody two shoe. I was an athlete. I was a young guy. So uh, I'm at the house, and he goes, "Go in there and wash my dishes." And it, he said it in such a, I'll never forget it. He said it in such a, a bully, bullying tone. You know, no, no kids ever bully me. Just so you guys know, I was never bullied. 
I was never bullied. I fought. If you wanted to bully me, we were going to fight. <laughs> I was never down with that bully. My last name is McNutt, so you know <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know how kids are. They, they, they were funny. McNutt. The only bully I ever dealt with was my father. He was the only bully I ever dealt with. No, no other human being has ever bullied me, and nobody will ever bully me. I stand up for myself. It's one of the tenets that I'm preaching to everyone is to stand up for yourself, to have a backbone for yourself. So the only bully I ever dealt with was my dad. Now, uh, he told me go in there and wash the dishes, his dishes, because I wasn't there. I didn't eat. I, I, I never ate at the house. I would just buy my food out. And I was just like, okay, well, I go in there and it's just like, it's a double sink and the dishes are just everywhere. And I said, I'm, I'm not washing all of these dishes. I just worked an eight hour shift after two hours of training. I'm not washing all these dishes. Uh, you raised me and what you told me was to clean up after myself. And not to, to let a mess of this magnitude foster. He, ha he hated when I said that. He hated it when I said that. He thought I was being disrespectful. Because I was talking back. Now any of you millennials out there. You've probably heard that talking back. Don't talk back to me. What does that even mean? Don't talk back. So you can just talk at me, but I can't respond. I can't, like, you get the final word just because you're older than me or because you're my parent. So I cannot speak. You tell, on one, one accord, you tell me to speak my mind, to say how I feel in class and you know, with friends, but then with you, don't talk back. <laughs> I mean, if any of you guys are doing this with your with your children now, I just want you to know it's confusing. Oh yeah, raise your hand. Participate in school. Know the right answer. Yeah, make sure the teacher calls on you. But when it comes to giving me feedback about how I parent you, don't talk back. I'm no expert on raising children, but I know people. And when you try to have a uh, conversation with someone, actually, that's not even a conversation. When you try to manipulate and control someone by simply saying, don't talk back, you're going to get your wish. That person is going to eventually stop talking to you because they cannot talk to you. Because when you get information that you don't like, you say, don't talk back. little introspection check for any of you people out there with those type of parenting skills. It may not be working. Don't talk back. So, you know, he said, don't talk back to me. Just go in there and wash my dishes. Now, the dishes is him and his girlfriend. I'm 18 years old. They're what, 35, 38-ish? I don't know their exact age. That's just my guess at the time. They're sitting in the living room, lounging, watching television. I just came, I'm 18 years old. And I just came home from working after training for two hours because I'm a collegiate athlete in the summertime preparing. I'm tired. Guess what? My shift starts at 6 a.m. So I need to go to bed. So you saying go in there and wash your dishes. Hey, hey. Man, no, I hate washing dishes. Like, why do you want me to do the one thing I hate? You could have said sweep and mop, and I would have done it because I like sweeping and mopping. You know, I like washing dishes. Go find me 10 Americans who like, who enjoy washing dishes, and I will find you 10 liars. <laughs> so here's what happened. I'm about to reenact my father. There may be some profanity in here. If there are children around, cover their ears. Nah, you gonna go in there 
and you're going to wash them goddamn dishes and you're not going to talk back to me. And if you what? Go in there and wash them damn dishes right now. I don't want to wash the dishes. It's not fair. I didn't eat. You guys made food. You didn't get me any food. There's no food left. This is dishes for you and your girlfriend. You guys are grown. You can wash your own dishes. Oh, my God. The rage that came over my dad. <laughs> the rage. It was like... <laughs> It was like this this inner beast that was inside of him that was waiting to be triggered. And me telling him, I'm not washing you. I may have said you and your lazy girlfriend's dishes. I might I might have said that that might have triggered him. And he went from like a, a like a yelling to like a screaming. And I don't even know which one is louder or more intense. I really don't know. I probably need to Google what's more intense, yelling or screaming. Let's see. When I picture yelling, I picture like, ah, like, you know, like a, but screaming is just like, ah. Okay, so he, so he went from yelling to screaming. There we go. We just figured it out. <laughs> so I'm standing my ground and I'm like, no, I'm about washing these dishes. This is, no. He grabs me. He like, <clears throat> literally grabs me by my my the back of my neck like he had this like claw <laughs> and he put this claw in the like the back of my neck he was just like <laughs> and he like then he like the other hand just like comes up under my armpit and he like takes me into the kitchen <laughs> so he's got this claw in my in my neck and he's got like this underhand grip under my arm so I'm just like paralyzed so he moves me into the kitchen and he's like, OK, here you go. Wash these dishes right now. And he stands there. So now he's forcing me to wash him, his and his girlfriend's dishes. He's forcing me to. It went from making a statement, making a demand to then yelling, to then screaming, to then physical force and then literally standing over me, monitoring me as I'm standing in front of the sink to make sure that I execute what he what he told told me to do. At this point, I told myself, I'm not washing anything. You're not gonna you're not going to put your hands on me. You're not going to talk to me however you think you can talk to me. Just because I allowed it in the past because I was smaller and I didn't realize that it was toxic and I didn't realize that I didn't realize that people could stand up for themselves. I dealt with it. But at that moment, I changed. And I said, you know what? I no longer want to deal with this. I no longer want to deal with this. I no longer want to deal with this. I no longer want to be controlled. I no longer want to be in an environment where you think it's okay to put your hands on me. I no longer deserve to be in a space where it's okay, where you think it's okay to abuse me. I no longer want to be around people who want to cause me harm. I no longer want to be around people who hate me. I no longer want to be around people who hold me back. I no longer want to be around people who claim to love me, but treat me like they hate me. I no longer longer want to be around people who think abuse is okay. I no longer want to be around people who think it's okay to manipulate me. I no longer want to be around people who I have to walk on eggshells to be around because I'm fearful that they may harm me, hurt me, attack me, scare me. I no longer deserve to be around that. This is what you have to tell yourself when it's time to let go. This is what you have to tell yourself. That sounds like that's a connection that I have to break up with. That sounds like that's an idea I have to break up with. That sounds like that's a behavior I have to break up with. That sounds like that's some pain I have to break up with. The behavior of the physical abuse that my father placed on me. The idea that it was okay and that it was acceptable and that I had to deal with it because I was a child. 
the connection of my connection with my father, the pain of the past of 18 years of abuse. In that situation, I had all four. And when you have all four, you 100% have to let go. You 100% have to leave. You 100% have to take a risk on the unknown. You 100% have to walk into the abyss of nothingness so you can get away from the very thing that is causing you pain, causing you suffering. That is when you walk away. That is how you walk away. And then when I told him no, when I stood my ground, when I said that I will no longer stand for this, he grabs a skillet. My father played in double A baseball, so he was a professional baseball player. He swings the skillet at my head. I duck like I'm Neo in Matrix. The skillet goes over my head and hits the wall, leaves a dent in the wall. Silence clears the room. I run out. I go to the bedroom. There's only a couple of things in the bedroom. My very first flip phone, cell phone, Sanyo, Sprint. My PlayStation 2. Couple of games and some clothes. No card. I grab everything I have. I throw it in a black garbage bag because I didn't have any duffel bags or anything of that nature. So I threw it in a black garbage bag. Double bagged it. Bagged my clothes. Bagged my PlayStation and my cell phone. Ran out of the house. As I'm getting my stuff ready, my father yelling, screaming, rage mode. Get out. Get the F out of my house. Get the F out of my house. You ungrateful, lazy mf -er. Get the out of my house. You don't deserve to be here. I'm not taking care of you anymore. Get the F out. His girlfriend sits, does nothing. Okay, well, I'll be gone then, because I'm not dealing with this anymore, sir. The behavior, the idea, the connection, the pain. I got to go, and I got to go. So I left, walked to my high school. Keep in mind, I'm in college at this point. I'm no longer in high school. I was back at my dad's apartment where I went to high school. So I walked to my high school. Summertime, nobody was there. I went and sat on the the uh, sidewalk. I went and sat on the sidewalk. Sidewalk I walked up, walked by so many times, walking to school, walking to practice, walking to football games, walking to track meets. I love my high school. I love all the people I knew in high school. I, I, I made so many good connections in high school. People taught me a lot. Thank you. Thank you guys for teaching me and embracing me. High school was very important for me, for my journey. I met a lot of good people. I sat at my high school. This was the first time I meditated. That was the very first time I meditated. I'm not religious. I was raised a Christian. People are gonna. People always ask me this. I was raised Christian. Uh, I don't like Christianity. I don't like what it did to me, to my people. Yeah, I guess we're going there today, huh? I guess we're talking about religion today, huh? I had to let go of Christianity because Christianity hurt me. My dad was a Christian. My mom was a Christian. All the people I know who caused me the most pain in my life are Christians. So why would I want to be that? Part of the reason that black people in America, in my opinion, were slaves as long as we were, is because we had hope in that so-called Christianity. And that's what they gave us. They gave us those, 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 that Christianity, and all those hymns and songs. And that's not what we needed. We didn't need hope. We need to see reality. And for those for those who saw reality and they said, oh, no, this is not. No, no, no. No, 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 no. We have to go. You know what? And it's funny that now that I, I, I talk about that. Hmm. Let me think about this.
if your mind is open enough, I know that slavery is an extreme, uh, it's an extreme thing that has happened and it could still be happening that somewhere in the world, I may not be aware of it. So I don't want to say it as if, you know, um, if I'm naive to that, there is some slavery somewhere in the world. I don't want to act as if it's not it's not happening. It could be, but if we just think about what slavery is, don't think about it so intensely. You know that it's people oppressing you. It's people holding you back. It's people keeping you attached and chained. And there, there is a physical slavery that occurs. There's also mental, emotional, psychological slavery. And with the story I'm giving you, I'm giving you uh, a story about a child who was in slavery, who was enslaved to his parents and his oppressors were his parents. I don't mind sharing this story with you guys because I'm over the pain of the story. I feel like one of my purposes is to share these things so we can connect and so we can get through so we can get over it. I'm over it now. And the way I got over it is, when I stood there, I said the behavior that I did, the connection, the pain has to go, I walked out. No money, no car, no home. I walked out, walked to my high school and sat there for hours and I meditated. This was the first time I meditated. When I, when I walked out of the house, I also broke up with that religion that I grew up with. I remember thinking to myself, what type of holy people would do this? If you read my care package book or you read my next book for your energy, you'll see this same line or similar line in, in both books that says, don't trust any person who acts righteous. Don't trust any holy person. Don't trust any person who acts like they have no flaws, who acts like they can do no wrong. I can tell you right now, people with followers, celebrities, people always act like they're so righteous. I can tell you right now, I'm not. I've made full of mis many, many mistakes. I have a life of mistakes. I have a lot. I have hurt people. I have hurt people. I have lied to people. I have done people wrong, not intentionally, but sometimes, yeah. Sometimes I, I'm, I've been like, you know what? I feel you. Can you sit here and say that too? Or will you lie to me about it? If, if you were sitting here with me, would you lie? You, pro you probably will lie. Most, most of you will lie. But I can tell you that I've caused people pain. I can tell you that I've lied to people. I can tell you that I've hurt people. I don't say that to brag. It, doesn't, it does not feel good. I tell you that because there is no such thing as a holy person. You may look up to me, you may listen to my podcast, you may read my books, and that's great. And I hope that you continue, and I hope that you get value out of it. But what Sylvester McNutt III is after is truth. Not falsified images, not, not perfection. So I will never present perfect to you. And uh, I hope you're not out here looking for perfect from anyone and presenting yourself as perfect. Because that's not sustainable and that's not real. That's not real. So I sat in my high school and I meditated. And I said, oh, wow, what am I going to do? Like, I actually remember talking to myself in that tone. Man, what am I going to do? Like, <laughs> I'm just sitting here. It's getting dark. <laughs> uh, I don't have anywhere to go. I only have about 150 bucks. School doesn't start for another three months. <laughs> You know, I knew I was going to stay in the dorms my sophomore year, so I knew I would have housing then. And I'm just sitting here thinking like, oh, man, what do I do for the next two months? So I was seeing this girl. Her name is Shelly. I give her a shout out just in case she comes across this. And she held me down. And I want to I want to I want to thank I want to thank you, Shelly, if you ever see this, because. You held me down in a time of need. She really helped me out. She called, she called, keep in mind we're 18. She called her parents and told them what was going on. Parents let me stay at the house for about two days. 
you know, of course, uh, like I can't think of a, anyone who's like, oh yeah, let your boyfriend move in. No, two days, let him figure figure out his life. That's probably what I would do too if I was in her dad's situation. So I'm really grateful that he let me stay. Um, so I stayed with them for two days, and they had a, they got a huge house and just good family, and um, we ate food together, and it was good. It was a good vibe. It was a good time. I stayed in limbo for like 48 hours, but it was in the summertime, and I love sports. So football, or sorry, basketball was on. I just remember watching the basketball games on their TV, and um, trying to figure out what I was gonna do. So what ends up happening, you know, I called some family members, told them what was going on. Um, called my mom first, told her what was going on. Didn't want to stay with family. I was embarrassed, ashamed. You know, you don't want to explain to family members, oh yeah, my dad kicked me out of the house. It's just, there's just like a shame element. You don't want to explain that. Especially because, now I'm not saying this is true, but this is how it looked to me. All my cousins, it looked like they had, you know, parents together or both parents in their life. Uh, so it was just like, there was like almost a jealousy or envy that I had for them because it's just like, well, your parents are together or your parents are actually nice. <laughs> your parents actually talk to you. Your parents actually like hanging out with you. Like both of my parents are just in the, you know? So there was a, a bit of envy, um, a bit of being uncomfortable with it and not knowing how to speak on it. I mean, I'm 18 years old. Like, you know, it's not, it's not a everyday experience for 18 year olds to get kicked out the house violently assaulted by their parent. Uh, with a cast iron skillet. It's not <laughs> uh, It's not something people deal with every day So I didn't I didn't really feel comfortable explaining that to anyone. I kind of want to just keep that to myself So Mike Kruger comes along Mike Kruger shout out to Mike Kruger Mike Kruger and this is this is inter this is an interesting plot twist if you're still listening Mike Kruger and his family I believe were Christians I believe they went to church every Sunday. Mike gets a wind of what's going on. His family immediately, Sly can come, Sly can come over here and he can stay here the whole summer. That's immediately what they said. I, I've known his family because Mike was a junior when I was a senior. So when Mike came on varsity, you know, I always looked after him. Like, I love, I love that dude, man. He was always working hard. He was humble. He was a funny ass dude. Excuse me. He was a funny guy. And, uh, you know, I know I knew his parents, his sisters, we were, we were just good. And so when they found out I was kicked out, they just treated me like I was one of their sons. They were like, oh no, you can come stay here. We had a basement with a big couch in it. You can stay there. Like you're, you're good. So that kind of blew my mind. That blew my mind that they did that. It was life changing. So um, yeah, they picked me up in my, my duffel bag and I stay with Mike, Mike Kruger. I stay with him for about two and a half months until school started back up in August. I think I went to church with them every week. And I'm not religious. At this point in my life, I'm not religious. That's when my, I'm spiritual. I believe that I'm a spiritual being. I don't believe that I'm a religious being. It was at that point. <laughs> wow, this is crazy. I never thought about this till right now. It was that incident that caused me to break up with religion and caused me to start a spiritual journey to learn self, to learn the world. Wow, this is crazy. So it, in the end, I ended up letting go of the relationship with my father because his behavior was not healthy. His ideas were not healthy for me. There was too much pain there. So those are the four pillars that will tell you if you have to let go. And all of them were, yes, let go, yes, let go, yes, let go, yes, let go. This is one of the most important stories of my life because it helps me understand. It helps me understand. And when you understand, that's how you heal. That's how you free yourself. 
Me and my dad didn't talk for five years. He tried to talk to me. He tried to send me uh, Christmas gifts. He tried to call. I wanted nothing to do with him. All of that felt fake to me. Finally, one day, now I don't, I don't remember. It may have been my girlfriend at the time, Shannon, or it may have been my auntie, Syl. I, I can't remember which one of them it was. It could have been my girlfriend, Shannon, while we were visiting my auntie, Syl's house. I don't remember. But one of them said something to me like this. Hey, Sylvester, you know, you don't talk to your dad. And I understand why you don't talk to him, because he, he did some bad stuff. But you can't be mad forever. You can't you can't be this angry at him forever. Like at some point you're gonna have to let it go. Cause as soon as his name comes up, you get angry, you get pissed. And it's just it's not good to see you like that. And I don't know who said that to me. I don't know if it was my girlfriend at the time or if it was my auntie Sil. I mean both two two people that I will care about forever. But when those words came to me, I really just said to myself, wow, you're right. I've been holding a grudge for five years. I'm over it, but I'm still holding a grudge. And that's when I realized, if you hold a grudge, your pain only gets deeper. Now, I'm not saying it's easy to let go because it's not. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes understanding. But if you hold a grudge, you will never let go. A grudge is the pain. A grudge is a part of the pain. And if you're holding a grudge with someone, that means they're in your head and they're in your heart when they're not even around you. They have the ability to piss you off when they're not even around you. That is why you have to forgive. And that's why you cannot hold a grudge. You don't want to be walking around with that energy. You don't want to be walking around pissed off. You don't want to be walking around triggered, upset. You have to, you have to let it go. You cannot hold a grudge. Like, if you're holding a grudge, you're not moving on from the pain. If you're holding a grudge, you'll never be happy. If you're holding a grudge against someone because of what they did to you, you'll never free yourself. You'll never let go. Letting go means you let go. I'm done with it. It's all good. When they said that to me, and I really was able to then introspect, because that's what it is, is you, you, you need to be able to um, reflect inwardly. And when I was able to reflect inwardly, I realized, like, I need to let this go. So I called my dad the next day. I called my dad the next day and I said, look, we need to talk. I need to tell you about how you hurt me, about what the last five years of my life has been like because of you. He was open to that. If he would have said no, we, we I probably would have hung up. He said, okay talk we created a, a safe space for me to share and talk and explain he heard me he apologized in that moment our relationship was healed he acknowledged the pain he caused me he acknowledged he was wrong he offered to change said that he was a different person. He said that 
five years without contacting me hurt him. I'm his firstborn son. He said it hurt him a lot. He said that he treated me that way because the world is going to treat me that way. And that he wanted to just toughen me up and make sure I was strong. I think he invited me over for dinner. So I went. Yeah, so I went. We had dinner. We laughed. We joked. We reconnected. We developed a new relationship. We developed a new healthy relationship. I put up uh, boundaries. I put up boundaries. I told him I was going to put up boundaries. And I said, "You look. I, I just don't know if I can trust you. The, uh, you know the way a person would like to trust their parents. So we're just going to have some healthy boundaries in place here." He understood. We we'll continued our relationship. Uh, I believe we got another four, four or five years, maybe three or four. I, I don't remember, but maybe three to five years we got, and then he passed away. And now he's passed. He's been, he passed away in 2014, and I have total peace in my heart because when it came to letting go, I let go. I let go when I was supposed to let go. I let go when he caused me the most harm. When I was 18 years old, I let go. The situation told me to let go. And what some people do, when a situation tells you to let go, you fight it because you have some idea of how things should go or how they should be, so you fight it. You refuse to change. You refuse to adapt with the change. And so you suffer. And that's why you suffer because you're not listening to the situation that is telling you to let go. You're holding on for dear life because your entire identity is wrapped up in a situation or an idea or a specific outcome. And because you don't know how to adapt to change, you suffer. In the situation I gave you, there was no continuing. It had to be ended at that moment when I was 18. So I let go at the right time. I held a grudge for five years. And when you hold a grudge against someone, you hold the pain. You're not letting go of the pain. You're not forgiving them. You're holding on to the anger, to the bitterness, to the resentment. And I'm not saying you have to let go of that. If you want to hold on to that, you can because you have free will and you have the choice to. But what I'm saying is if you try to let it go and you try and you try and you try and you try to let it go. And you try and let go of the grudge and you tell yourself, I'm over this grudge and I don't want to hold a grudge and I don't want to harvest any of this negativity or anger in my heart. You'll free yourself from it. And then you'll let go of that. And then that's what I did. I let go of that. Then we had a chance to reconnect. Now, when you deal with anything toxic, you need healthy boundaries. Actually, that doesn't even make any sense. Any sense. Let me Let me say that a different way because... If you deal with something toxic, you can't have healthy boundaries with something toxic. If something is toxic, you cannot have healthy boundaries with, with it. You either let it in your life and you let it ruin you, or you just stay away from it. Toxic is the worst thing something can be. If you have toxins in your body from something you ate, you know your body does its best to get rid of them, to let them go, to get them, flush them out. It's not good for you. You cannot have a healthy relationship with someone who is totally toxic. If you are in a toxic situation, stop looking for what is healthy or good about it. You need to leave it. You either change it or leave it. If you can change it, then yeah, change it. If you cannot change the toxic situation, you leave it. That's simple to me. Is there problems and conflict with uh, work colleagues at work, with friends and family? Yeah, just a, a problem is not toxic. Having a problem with someone is not toxic. When I'm talking about toxic, I'm talking about abuse. 
I'm talking about psychological warfare. I'm talking about emotional manipulating uh, just that's toxic when it's to that level. If it's just regular conflict, it's not a big deal. You can deal with that. Handle that. If it's toxic, you have two choices. You change it instantly or you leave it. I'm going to give you a quick summary here of what we talked about today. When you need to move on, you have to understand that the whole process is brave. It's about bravery. You are brave. If you are attempting to move on, you are brave. Bravery means fighting for something greater than you. If you're attempting to move on from something, you're fighting for something greater than you right now, which may be your mental health in about four months, which is probably greater than you. Although I would love to tell you to stay in the moment, stay here. Maybe your mental health sucks right now and you want it to be great in three or four months. Well, that means that you're fighting for something greater than you at the moment. And that is a beautiful thing. Keep fighting. Keep fighting. To fight for something greater than you, you have to sacrifice, let go. And always remember there's that greater cause. The second component to moving on is effort. You have to give yourself the effort. And it starts in here. It starts with that inner conversation, those inner feelings that you have. The last thing, the four pathways to letting go. You have to examine behavior, ideas, connection, and pain. If you have to let go of something, just simply ask, is this a behavior? Is this an idea? Is this a connection? Or is this pain? If you ask yourself that, those are the four pathways to letting go. It's a behavior. I need to stop doing this because it's giving me an unpleasant experience. I need to end this idea because thinking this way keeps producing the same conflict or it is a connection I have to let go of and I have to cease to exist with this person. We cannot continue to go on the way we're going on or it's some pain from some previous moment that I have not dealt with, I have not faced. Everything that you may have to let go of in life comes down to those four things right there. So when you realize you have to let go, address those things. Now, if a situation uh, ticks off all four boxes, boom, 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 behavior, idea, connection, pain, you got to go. You got to go. Thank you for listening to the Sylvester McNutt the Third podcast for your energy episode three. Like I said, if you don't know, it's on YouTube. YouTube.com slash slide McNutt. You can find the podcast for all you guys on YouTube. You can find the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and SoundCloud. Connect with me on your social media. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, everywhere. Just type Sylvester McNutt the third. There's, it's just me. I promise you I'm not hard to find on social media. I have a unique name. Sylvester McNutt the third. Today the story I told you came directly out of my book on healing. Care Package. A Path to Deep Healing. This book will help you heal. If you have not read Care Package, A Path to Deep Healing, get it. It will help you. The third chapter is actually called Letting Go. Letting Go. Uh, that story that I gave you, it's in there. I could have read it, but I wanted to give you the story. I wanted to talk to you about it, and I wanted to give you commentary, so that's what I did. There's a lot of good quotes in here. I'll read you a couple. You'll never move on from someone if you keep investing in him or her when history has proven that there is no return on the investment. Walking away from toxic. You stop making excuses for the way they treat you. You realize that their manipulation and games will no longer work. You become brave enough to walk away and wise enough to stay away. Oof. I need to post that. I might have to post that on Sunday when I post the link to the pod. If you're trying to leave a toxic situation and a person tries to persuade you to stay, F them. 
they need to be cut off too. See, a person who really loves you does not want to see you in a toxic situation. Let go of the idea that you need to tolerate shitty behavior. I'm trying not to curse at all, but, you know, it happens. Letting go means allowing your flesh to shed, your tears to run, and your heart to ache. Not forever, just long enough to wash all the energy off of you that no longer deserves to be there. Let go of the mindset that you never need to leave your neighborhood, your state, your little narrow box. Growth happens when you wander into new spaces. All those quotes I just read to you are from the Care Package book. You can get it from SylvesterMcNutt.net, Amazon.com, Care Package, A Path to Deep Healing. My friends, I drop a podcast every Sunday. Thank you for listening this Sunday or catching me Monday morning on your drive-in or whenever you heard me. I'm very appreciative of this platform because it allows me to express and think in full form. Twitter is limiting, what is it, 280 characters. Instagram is limiting. The caption is limiting. You only get a minute on videos or photos. Podcasts and books allow me to fully express. I like the podcast because I don't edit it. So you're getting just raw, raw data. I'm sending you love, sending you good energy. See you next week.